Здравствуйте. For two years, actually. And finally you are here. Victor, I'm, I'm there in spirit, if not, if not in body. Thank you so much for, for continuing to persist and invite me to, to, to Ukraine. I hope next time it'll be in person. I hope too. You know, when uh, I, I was a schoolboy, we always were taught, taught that in London, everyone, when we meet, meet each other, uh, the first question should be about the weather. So how is the weather in London? <laughs> I can show you. <laughs> yeah, thanks God. <laughs> Great. So yeah. I think you're, um, you are inspired and motivated to start your talk. And afterwards, uh, together with Inessa, we'll proceed with some question and discussion. Are you okay with that? Absolutely fine. Uh, just need to check with you that my slides are visible. Yeah. Just a second. Perfect. Everything is fine. If okay. you hear me, yeah, we are ready. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Victor. Um, so th this talk, uh, thanks, Inessa, for the talk leading up to this and, and, and introducing the concept that I'm going to speak on now. Um, this lecture is more about understanding preeclampsia than about managing preeclampsia. But at the end, uh, I will give you some insights as to why it's important to understand the disease better. The title is The Placenta, The Villain or The Victim. Um, as far as I'm concerned, throughout my medical career, I've been taught that the placenta is the villain. Um, I'm a simple person and, and I like simple uh, pathways and simple explanations. And the explanation that we have been sold always is that the placenta here on the left-hand side doesn't develop properly. There, there's poor spiral artery transformation and, and therefore placental hypoperfusion, as can be seen here and that this damaged or poorly functioning placenta releases some agents, as you can see here. These agents, m m there may be angiogenic factors or anti-angiogenic factors, S-flip, PLGF, etc. It may be cellular debris, whatever it is, these factors go into the maternal circulation and here affect organs, whether it causes vasoconstriction and therefore high blood pressure, whether it causes damage to the liver and HELP syndrome, whether it causes damage to the endothelium of the kidney and causes proteinuria. Uh, that spectrum of uh, signs we recognize as preeclampsia, so hypertension, liver dysfunction, kidney dysfunction, and, and so far so good. And, and this is the story that is sold throughout the world in, in most medical schools and in most undergraduate and, and early postgraduate lectures. We decided a few years ago to relook and really try and get to the bottom of why we have not really made any progress with preeclampsia, despite it being a disease known for a hundred years, uh, and that we still haven't come up with a cure other than to end the pregnancy. Therefore, we decided to review the placental histology. And this is a systematic review of all of, this, all of the modern uh, placental histology undertaken in preeclampsia. And it's very, very important. Uh, the first thing it showed was that if the pathologist was told before he did the examination of the placenta that the woman had preeclampsia, that pathologist was three times more likely to report uh, features in the placenta which are characteristic of preeclampsia. If the pathologist wasn't told, i.e. they were blinded to the clinical diagnosis, they were three times less likely to report it. Irrespective of that, what this study showed of several systematic evaluations of, pre of preeclampsia is that both villus and vascular lesions, for example, spiral artery transformation or lack of, were not specific, nor were they sensitive to preeclampsia. But what I mean by that is that spiral artery transformation or lack of it was as evident in pregnancies that did not have preeclampsia as it was in pregnancies that did have preeclampsia, and that these features are not specific to preeclampsia, they were found in normal pregnancy and were also found in fetal growth restriction in the absence of high blood pressure. So we said, well, this is not consistent with the story we have been sold that spiral artery transformation is the major underlying feature and that placental uh, primary maldevelopment is, is an issue. So we then did the next extension and said, well, if the placenta is in trouble in preeclampsia, 
it should consistently be associated with small for gestational age cases. And we, what we found was that really in pre-temporary eclampsia, as most of you know as clinicians, uh, the majority of the time, 60-70% of the time in pre-temporary eclampsia, the baby is small. But 80% of pre-eclampsia occurs at term after 36 weeks. And at term, 85% of pre-eclampsia cases are associated with normal-sized babies or big babies. In fact, the rate of LGA birth, large for gestation age birth, with preeclampsia at term is 15%. And that is once we have excluded diabetic pregnancies. How can we reconcile a problem of the placenta which causes either normal or large babies in the majority of cases? Again, this birth weight of the babies in the majority of cases of preeclampsia is not consistent with a primary placental problem. And herein, there's an issue. Yeah. So all of the people, all of the, the biologists and researchers who, who believe in and, and, and um, focus on a placental primary cause of preeclampsia said it's very complex. It's much more complex than that first than the, than the first um, diagram we showed you, the cartoon. And over the years, this kind of uh, complex interaction to explain preeclampsia has been developed. Um, I don't expect you to see it. I don't read it. I can't remember it. And even now today, there is a seven-stage theory of preeclampsia, which is, um, you know, goes through several, several stages, and it's impossible to follow and impossible to predict. And, and essentially, we add on little extra bits to be able to try and pretend that we understand what is going on here. But fundamentally, it's not true. We can't understand this diagram, and it is unlikely that the disease, any disease, is so complex in its etiology. So we went back to the fundamentals. And the fundamentals suggest that here, that uh, at poor trophoblast invasion results in a number of well-defined cellular defects in the placenta on the right-hand side that you can see there, whether it's injury, apoptosis, or poor motility, etc. that there is primary trophoblast maldevelopment that causes those things in the placenta, which is placental damage and the syndrome of preeclampsia. But we've also been taught to believe the primary poor trophoblast invasion also results in the uterine artery malformation, uh, uterine artery Doppler changes that Inessa so clearly spoke about. The one thing I'd like you to ask is where else in the diseases of the human body is it that the cellular process controls the blood flow? When in reality, most of the time, in a pathological process, it's abnormal blood flow that results in cellular damage. Yes, cellular damage does not usually cause changes in blood flow. It's usually poor perfusion that results in poor cellular development. So this arrow, where we have been taught for 20 years that poor trophoblast invasion results in this high resistance uterine artery pattern, I would like you to question whether it's occurring the other way around. Let, let us put it more simplistically. We have been taught that this is what preeclampsia is. A maldevelopment of the placenta, releasing some factors that causes the syndrome we recognize as preeclampsia. We are looking at the placenta in isolation. This lecture is about considering and understanding that the placenta is an organ of perfusion. Its function is perfusion dependent, and it cannot work in isolation. And the placenta needs maternal blood flow, the maternal heart, to perfuse it in order to be able to work. Is it possible that this syndrome we recognize as preeclampsia is not a primary placental problem, but that what is happening here is that it is a primary cardiovascular problem and a cardiovascular problem, because of poor perfusion of the placenta, is causing placental damage and then resulting in preeclampsia. And that is what I'd like you to slightly open your mind for the next 15 minutes to see if you can understand it. If it were true that there is a primary cardiovascular problem that predisposes to preeclampsia, 
then the predisposing factors should be cardiovascular in origin. And we've been taught here on the right-hand side, you can see the commonly recognized and most important risk factors for preeclampsia, age, weight, height, or BMI, ethnicity, diabetes, whether the mother has chronic hypertension and whether she has autoimmune diseases or antiphospholipid syndrome, etc., etc. These are well-recognized uh, disorders that predispose. And we have spent many, many years trying to study how these uh, factors directly affect the placenta. And we have persistently ignored the fact that all of these factors are well-recognized predisposing factors to cardiovascular disease. Yes. So we're looking for what each height and weight and ethnicity and diabetes may directly affect the placenta without considering the possibility that they indirectly affect the placenta by compromising maternal cardiovascular function, which they haven't been known to do for several decades. And recently there was a paper that evaluated cardiovascular function before women became pregnant in about 400 cases. And they demonstrated, although the number of preeclampsia and small babies are small, but they demonstrated that the women with the worst cardiovascular function prior to pregnancy were the ones that were most likely to develop preeclampsia or fetal growth restriction. So the predisposing factors are all cardiovascular in nature. What about cardiovascular function in pregnancy? And what we did was we looked in 600 women at what's called cardiac remodeling. That means the thickening of the muscles and the growth of the muscles in response to the load of pregnancy. Yes, the increased volume of blood that the pregnancy uh, uh, exposes the maternal heart to. And what we showed is that in an average woman, in an average woman, the heart, the muscle of the heart on the left ventricle increases by 40% in nine months. I'm sure most of the audience, Victor, might recognize these two individuals, yes? And they would fit under the, under the criteria of elite athletes. Elite athletes like these brothers, yes, in a two-year training program, will only increase their left ventricular hustle, muscle mass by 25%. Yet, a Ukrainian woman sitting on the sofa watching TV will be able to increase her muscle mass by 40% in nine months. That is because unlike these boxing legends who train perhaps five hours a week, five days, uh, five hours a day, five days a week, a pregnant woman is dealing with an increased volume load 24 hours a day, seven days a week for nine months. So she's constantly training. And because of that constant exposure to increased load, the heart increases so much. It must come as no surprise to you that if the average woman is exposed to more load and work, cardiac work in pregnancy than an elite athlete, that some of those women can't cope with it. Yes, not all of us can be boxing heroes. And so what we did was we looked at the function of the heart that was associated with the increase in the muscle mass of the heart. And in the same 600 women, we showed that 10 to 15 percent of women had what was called diastolic dysfunction. We're all familiar with systolic dysfunction, which is the inability of the heart to contract properly. And that is what old men such as myself will develop because our heart is old and fibrotic and the muscle doesn't work so well and can't contract. In young people, systolic dysfunction is not a common feature, but the very elastic heart often has a problem in relaxing, which is also a uh, dysfunction of the heart and a very serious dysfunction of the heart, but it doesn't present often with the symptoms that you and I recognize. However, what we did show is that a very small proportion of our women, uh, 9 out of the 600, yes, had systolic dysfunction. That's the sort of dysfunction where they start to develop symptoms. And here, if you can see at the bottom, we have shortness of breath, swelling of the legs, lack of energy, difficult sleeping, increased peeing or urination at night. These are all symptoms that you and I recognize as symptoms of pregnancy, except this little diagram at the bottom was taken from heartfailure.co.uk. This is what happens in heart failure. 
out of the nine women in our group that had systolic dysfunction, eight of them had shortness of breath at rest, which is pathological. So if your woman sitting in front of you at nine months has shortness of breath at rest while she's sitting there, not while she walked up the stairs, then there is a very high probability that she has systolic dysfunction and that given a few days or a week, she will develop preeclampsia. So what happens to cardiovascular function in preeclampsia? Now, originally, 10 years ago, it was just my research group that was publishing stuff and, and saying this is a big problem and we need to pay more attention to it. Now you'll be pleased to see that you don't have to bear and see my slides anymore, that there are now 48 studies, yes, and this is a meta-analysis that shows that pregnancy is a significant strain on the maternal heart and that pregnancy causes mild levels of dysfunction, causes the heart to go under some degree of strain. And there are now 36 studies which show that when preeclampsia develops, there is overt cardiac dysfunction in the majority of women that have this disorder. Now, as Inessa alluded to, what happens after the pregnancy? We all have believed that the cure for preeclampsia is birth. We deliver the woman and the disease ends. More recently, we have begun to understand that perhaps that is not the case. This is a study I did with my Danish colleagues and reviewing a million women who had uh, over a period of time, some of whom had preeclampsia. And what we demonstrated was actually more, in, more revealing than we wanted to see. These uh, bars here on the right, uh, at the bottom in the solid line are women who did not have preeclampsia. So you can see here on the right hand side that a 40 year old woman who did not develop preeclampsia has about a 10% risk of developing chronic hypertension after she has a baby. But a 20 year old woman who has preeclampsia has a higher risk of developing chronic hypertension than a 40 year old woman who does not. Preeclampsia, first of all, predisposes a large proportion of the population, 20 to 30% of women developing chronic hypertension within a decade, within 10 years. Number two, it has the effect of increasing a woman's cardiovascular age by about 20 years. Yes, that's worse than smoking. That's worse than smoking. So a woman who has preeclampsia has worse cardiovascular prognosis than someone who is a heavy cigarette smoker. So there is another disease which we recognize as gestational diabetes where the definitions of gestational diabetes and hypertension disorders of pregnancy are very, very similar. Gestational diabetes is new onset abnormal glucose before 20, after 20 weeks, preeclampsia, new onset hypertension after 20 weeks. Predisposing factors for gestational diabetes, the same as for diabetes. And as we've already discussed, the predisposing factors for preeclampsia are the same as for cardiovascular disease. The diagnosis of gestational diabetes, high glucose levels. The diagnosis of preeclampsia, high blood pressure levels. If a woman has pre-pregnancy disease with diabetes before pregnancy or hypertension before pregnancy, then they have a much more severe abnormal pregnancy. We've always considered the cure for gestational diabetes as birth. The same is true of preeclampsia. And most importantly, the long-term outcome, 50% of women after gestational diabetes will develop um, overt diabetes within 10 years. And we have just shown you that 30% of women after preeclampsia will develop chronic hypertension in 30 years. The screening test is very interesting, and I'm going to come on to talk to you about it. Just uh, GTT measures the ability of the pancreas to respond to a load. Uh, and that's how we tell that the woman may be at increased of gestational diabetes. In the screening tests that Inessa talked about, we use blood pressure. Blood pressure is a cardiovascular marker. We use uterine artery Doppler. Doppler is a vascular profile assessment. It's not assessing the placenta directly, it's assessing the maternal cardiovascular. I would argue with you that these factors are actually reflecting maternal cardiovascular function. So I would like you to give, have a much more simplistic approach to preeclampsia. 
I would like you to have this kind of approach, which is a supply and demand yes, cycle, which we're all very familiar with. The heart has the responsibility of perfusing and feeding the placenta. And as long as it does that, the pregnancy is fine. If there is a primary cardiac problem that predisposes to poor placental perfusion, mainly because of things like age, obesity, ethnicity, diabetes, all of these things, yes, which, which cause the mother to have poor cardiac reserve, then there is hypoperfusion of the placenta, and a poorly performing placenta will result in the syndrome we recognize as preeclampsia. On the other hand, it may be, and that, that's typically a preterm one, on the other hand, it may be that the mother's heart function is good enough to get her to nine months. But what happens at nine months is that the mother may have fetal macrosomia or a twin pregnancy or a prolonged pregnancy, or even she may have put on too much weight in pregnancy. This is nothing to do with poor supply. This is to do with excessive demand. Now, if the demands are excessive above and beyond a normally functioning heart, then the same syndrome will develop because the heart is in, unable to supply the excessive demands of the placenta and the same outcome will be true. So this supply demand cycle explains the, 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 the syndrome of preeclampsia, whether it is preterm or term, it's not two different diseases, it's the same disease but there is a predisposition to poor supply with preterm and excessive demand with term preeclampsia. And the very important thing we must not ignore is the fact that because the heart is involved, it predisposes not only to cardiovascular disease such as hypertension and, and heart attack, myocardial infarction, it also predisposes to um, stroke and dementia, vascular dementia, and it also predisposes to chronic kidney disease. And these are all in the specter of poor cardiovascular function. So, this is at the point of the lecture where we split the audience. Some of you who are open-minded uh, are going to be uh, certainly convinced, if not um, understand the arguments I have put forward to you. Some of you will be highly intellectuals like this, uh, random example I have chosen uh, and will have you know a, a foreboding and persisting belief that perhaps masks don't help or perhaps a lockdown isn't useful and we need to deal with that conflict yeah not disrespect it we need to talk about what are the issues that have been presented and why you may have a fundamental distrust of a new hypothesis in preeclampsia one that is fundamentally impossible to argue against and the most commonly held one is nulliparity that women who are having their first pregnancy are far more likely to have preeclampsia. And that is evidence, we believe. We've gone from an epidemiological observation, yes, that women having their first pregnancy are more likely to have preeclampsia. And suddenly we extrapolate an immune hypothesis. We haven't looked at anything in the middle, yes. We haven't looked at the tissues or the function or the flows. We've gone straight from an epidemiological observation to a molecular diagnosis without any evidence in the middle. And we say, well, Nulliparity is a sort of immune disorder. Actually, yes, just like the boxing legends of Ukraine, nothing to do with that. It's to do with training. A multiparous woman has had a pregnancy before where a heart has expanded and the function has increased. And in reality, if a multiparous woman has a baby within a few years of having the last baby, then a heart which has been in training in the last pregnancy is better able to respond. And that was shown as early as 1997, 20 years ago, there was a fantastic study, albeit with a small number of women, which showed exactly this uh, graph on the right, which is that multiparous women have about a 20% better cardiovascular response in pregnancy than an oleparous woman. Yes, and those studies have been repeated now with 1,500, 4,600 patients and shows exactly the same things, exactly the same things that oleparous uh, women because they have not been exposed to a pregnancy, are less able to produce a good cardiovascular response. The other issue that is brought up is partner specificity. Yes, you change partners and you're more likely to get preeclampsia. And that certainly may have been true from the, from the original data sets that they looked at in the 1960s and 1970s. 
The problem was in the 1960s and 1970s, when a woman left her partner, it took her several years, yes, and the stigma was so bad in the 60s and 70s, it took her several years to find a new partner and trust him and to have a child with him. And that interval was often very, very long. And it could be that the new partner is important, but it also could be that a new partner represents a long interpregnancy interval, that there were many years before she had a, had the second baby. And in that time, the heart's, you know, without continuous training, it is less able to deal with the pregnancy. And that's exactly what this study of a million women showed. What they showed was that the risk of preeclampsia was not related actually to the new partner or not. The risk of preeclampsia was related to the years since the previous delivery. That the new partner wasn't the reason that preeclampsia occurred. It was the interpregnancy delay and interval. Nowadays, the, if you look at the epidemiology, a new partner is not a significant risk factor because nowadays there is often very few uh, days, months or years before a woman has a baby with a new partner and therefore the interpregnancy interval is short and the new partner does not represent a significant risk. We're coming to the end. Finally, we believe that IVF is a predisposing factor for preeclampsia. Well, actually, if you look at the data here, it is not IVF, but ovum donation that predisposes to preeclampsia. Yes, ovum donation has a threefold higher preeclampsia risk than IVF or ICSI. Ovum donation has a threefold higher preeclampsia risk than spontaneous pregnancy in that red bar that you can see there. And actually, if you compare IVF to spontaneous pregnancy and you correct for age and weight, then there are no differences in IVF per se versus spontaneous pregnancy. So ovum donation is a predisposing factor. And here the explanation is really quite simple. Who are the women that generally require ovum donation? They're women who have had premature ovarian failure or have mosaic Turner syndrome at low level mosaicism and therefore they're, they are unable to get pregnant. Both premature ovarian failure and Turner syndrome predispose significantly to increased cardiovascular risk. So this has nothing to do with the ovum and a new interaction. This is simply to do with the cardiovascular status of the mother. I'm going to finish with this. Does it really matter? Is it really important? You know, should we really understand the disease or not? And I would argue with you that it absolutely does. We have this, um, we have this preeclampsia screening test, which works very, very well. Yes. And I'm, tomorrow, I think I'm going to talk, tell you a bit more about screening because I don't think we have the time today, but we use blood pressure. Yes. This is the FMF screening algorithm. Blood pressure is a cardiovascular marker, you all agree. We use uterine artery Doppler, and we always believe uterine artery Doppler is reflecting what's happening in the placenta. But the reality is that the ophthalmic artery Doppler in the eye is as good as the uterine artery Doppler in this screening tool. Yes, so it doesn't have to be the blood flow to the uterus. You can take the blood flow in the wrist or in the eye, and it will equally predict preeclampsia well enough. So what that's telling you is that the uterine artery Doppler is providing its information not because it is looking at blood flow to the placenta, but because it's assessing the peripheral waveform of the mother and assessing the cardiovascular compliance. Finally, you say, well, PLGF, well, that's placental growth factor. It's absolutely reflecting the placenta. There is no doubt that in pregnancy, PLGF mainly comes from the placenta. But what perhaps many of you don't know is that PLGF is produced in men, it's produced in children, Yes, and that PLGF function, yes, function of PLGF is to help heart remodeling and increase in vascular mass of the heart, in the muscle mass of the heart. So PLGF is called placental growth factor because it's identified in the placenta, but it's produced by the endothelium of all of our body vessels and organs. So it's produced in men and children, and it is increased in men and children when they are under cardiovascular load. So PLGF is assessing cardiovascular load. So all of these tests that we're looking at here are reflecting maternal cardiovascular function. And I believe that in the future, the best predictors of preeclampsia and poor placental function will be cardiovascular in nature. And we need to move away from looking at placental markers and look at more cardiovascular markers. How about the diagnosis of preeclampsia? It is wrong that a hundred years since we, we discovered what preeclampsia was. We still use 200-year-old technology, a blood pressure cuff, to diagnose preeclampsia. That cannot be right.
especially in, a, in something that kills a woman every 10 minutes throughout the world. Uh, Inessa talked about SPLIT and PLGF, and that is uh, an emerging helpful tool. Uh, the problem with SPLIT and PLGF is that it's not really a point of care test. You have to take it, you have to send it to lab, wait for the results, and it also has a significant cost. Here's a paper which is in press in hypertension that we looked at, where we looked at point of care assessments using a simple tool of the blood flow, of the blood flow to the um, mother by assessing blood flow by putting a small tool just here in the neck. And that blood flow assessment um, showed that if uh, the woman had low cardiac output and high vascular resistance, that the interval between us seeing her and her developing preeclampsia was about two weeks, whereas if her cardiac output and vascular resistance was normal, there was a two and a half month delay on average before she developed preeclampsia. So these are simple point of care tools that we can use. If you have a woman who is has a borderline blood pressure, we can check her tool and within minutes, we can have a, a result that says, okay, well, she's safe. She doesn't need to be in the hospital. We can see her in two weeks time and measure her blood pressure or someone who has very low heart function with high vascular resistance. We say, no, she's going to develop preeclampsia within two weeks. We do something. So this is a much more sophisticated blood pressure assessment because we're not just taking the blood pressure, we're looking at cardiovascular function and the tools to do these sort of assessments are not complex and are not expensive. As Inessa has already said, women who develop with preeclampsia, if you assess their heart function properly, you'll find that the women with the worst heart function are the ones that are most likely to get uh, um, abnormal uh, outcomes. So this was a study with very high rates of pulmonary edema that showed that the women who developed lung edema were the ones that had heart dysfunction. So I'd like to leave you with this. At the end of the day, we have a supply demand cycle. And if supply is an issue, then we can pick that up using the FMF screening algorithm at 11 to 14 weeks using maternal factors, blood pressure, PLGF, and neutron Doppler. And that test is very good at picking up 70 to 80% of women who develop preterm preeclampsia because of poor supply. And that's a very, very good test. If demands are excessive because of macrosomia, prolonged pregnancy, twin pregnancy, etc., or, or excessive weight gain, then that is because there is an excessive demand. And that, again, can be assessed by the tools I've showed you. So simple heart cardiovascular assessments, also the antiogenic factors, etc., and they're predisposed to preeclampsia at term because of excessive demand. So this is my legend. When you're presenting a controversial hypothesis, no matter how true it is, yes, the people who have a belief and an investment in the previous theories first tend to ignore you, then they laugh at you, and then they fight you, and finally you win. Thank you, Victor. Thank you so much. It was a pure pleasure for us to hear us. Because you see that our whole uh, no. looks a bit post-apocalyptic. Yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't hear you, but, but I appreciate the thought and and the, and the, and, the, and, the, and the support. Here, yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. It was really, you know, um, it was not only very important lecture, but it was very um, inspiring lecture, meaning that how many things we still do not understand and how many misunderstandings actually uh, currently 
still to <clears throat> actually to blow in our understanding of the problems relating preeclampsia. You know, uh, frankly speaking, I thought that in the 21st century we know m almost everything, but it seems like we still know we nothing, or it's better to say English, know anything. And, you know, I always considered placenta to be somehow like a, like an, like a angel or something like an alien that comes from universe and it's not actually maternal and it's uh, not actually fetal. But now, correct me if I'm wrong, we can say that placenta is something that has fetal karyotype, but the basement is made from actually a vascular potential of the mother. And that's somehow the point where they meet and where they start to function. Yeah. So, uh, Victor, you, 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 you're right. Let us not get bogged down with where the cells come from, but just think of the placenta as a radiator. Do you have radiators in, 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 in Kiev? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, the things on the wall? Fantastic. So, for the radiator to work, it's got to have hot, air, hot water going through it, and it's got to have air moving over the fan. Um, so, when the radiator, when your house is too cold in the winter, the heating doesn't work and you call the engineer to come and look at your radiator do you tell him you can only look at my radiator but you can't look at the boiler or the motor in the cupboard yes and tell me what's wrong it's First, not going to work because if you tell him that's all he can do he can tell you well i think the radiator is cold and that's what we have done for a hundred years when the woman has preeclampsia we look at the placenta and we send the mother home. The mother is the boiler and the motor, which is pumping the hot water through the radiator. If you get your engineer in when the radiator is cold and you say, what's wrong with it? And you let him look at everything. He's going to tell you the boiler's not working or the motor's broken. So when we look at the mother, we find why the radiator is cold. We spent a hundred years telling everybody the radiator is cold without understanding why. Now, some of your audience will say, well, it doesn't really matter. I say it does, because only when you understand the disease can you do prediction, can you do prevention, can you do prognosis, yes? Can you do prophylaxis? These all fundamentally depend on the nature. We can spend millions treating the placenta just like your engineer can spend millions replacing your radiator, but you're not going to get warm. That's clear. Thank you so much. And you know, um, the problem maybe is that to look for radiator and for boiler both, you have to pay twice more. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, maybe that could be a problem for, uh, for countries with, um, let's say, medical insurance. But still, that's um, the only option. But I would like to continue talking about that just in two minutes. I will come back with my colleague and we have very interesting questions and we would be happy to hear even more interesting answers from you. Okay? You can take a sip of water and see you in two minutes. Thanks a lot. Я запрошую Інесу Миколаївну допомогти мені в моїй доповіді. І ми розпочнемо зараз дискусію з Баски. У нас є деякі питання з Would you have a chance for you to ask those questions with the use of Telegram channel? Please.
Здравствуйте. Я так рада, что вы здесь, но я бы счастлива, чтобы поднять руку лично здесь, в Киеве. No shaking hats anymore. We'll have to, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we have to do elbows. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Something like this. I thank you for being with us. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for this lecture. It is absolutely concentrated, uh, comprehensive, and um, consists of very important information for us. Um, I have a, a couple of questions for you. The first one is, if... Um, to take into account this very close relationship between preeclampsia and cardiovascular disorders in mother. Um, does it mean that somewhere in future we will get some new tools for uh, new approaches for management, for uh, prediction, prophylaxis and uh, treatment uh, probably? I mean something like mm, intermediate thickness or statine, uh, statine administration, not exactly, but um, something similar like this. What do you think about this? What do you think about the future of these uh, new tools? Yeah, so uh, yes, I think that's highly likely. Uh, um, the people, are, when the researchers who are spending millions looking at the placenta, use that money to look at cardiovascular function in pregnancy, then we will for sure improve our screening tools because we will have investigation of cardiovascular markers, so we will have better screening. Once we have identified the women that are most likely to develop pregnancy with high levels of accuracy, then we can start trials and studies which test various cardiovascular therapies. Yes? You know, the allergies, you know, the treatment for preeclampsia while you're waiting for delivery is antihypertensive agents, statins, anti yeah, it's a cardiovascular drug, metformin, cardiovascular drug, calcium, cardiovascular effect, or everything we use in preeclampsia is cardiovascular in nature. But we will perhaps have uh, better tools to be able to certainly ameliorate the disease. The warning is that I don't think we're going to have a cure. Because if we can cure preeclampsia, we can cure heart failure in the eight-year-old man, and we can't do that yet. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. a lot. We have a question from our colleagues. So, and this question would be uh, a great uh, start for another part of discussion, but uh, let's go forward. So, <coughs> clinical case. Women with obesity and diabetes um, came for preconception, for preconception care. We have recommended to decrease the body mass index and to control her sugars. Uh, then she got pregnant. We prescribed her calcium and aspirin. And uh, what else would you prescribe? And what is your attitude towards preventive prescription of L-arginine? Okay. Um, so there are many questions hidden in there. One is uh, pre-pregnancy counseling. Uh, whether a woman has diabetes before pregnancy or whether she has hypertension before pregnancy, the most, most important thing is that those two conditions need to be very well controlled at the time of conception. If you, I'm sure you do a hypertension clinic, and the $64,000 question I ask is, why do some women with chronic hypertension have a perfect pregnancy? And why do some women with chronic hypertension have the worst preeclampsia I've seen in the world? And they don't have it with each pregnancy. And, and the answer is really, really simple. It's the same as for diabetes. If her control of blood pressure was good around the time of conception, then the placenta develops well. If a mother's control of her diabetes is good at the time of conception, then she has a low risk pregnancy. So the most important thing is to make sure that she has good diabetic and good hypertensive control at, just at pregnancy. I don't know how effective controlling body weight is in Kiev, but it doesn't work in England uh, at all. So perhaps we should leave that for another day. Uh, in terms of therapy, Tomorrow I'll present our data on pregnancy screening 
in the UK, one of the poorest national health services in the world with no extra money. We have done some amazing things. I'll talk to you about that. But we used aspirin, very much like the FMF trial from 12 to 14 weeks onwards. We did not use l I think the, the body of evidence is still not very good for that. Uh, and uh, what was the other drug? Aspirin, for sure. So L actually, it works about that. that aspirin and calcium are more or less common in Ukraine. And nowadays, L-arginine, it seems to work, but there are too many questions. So that's why the question was regarding your yeah. own attitude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So calcium, um, there, are, there are certain populations where calcium is a benefit. So calcium trials done in populations where there is uh, widespread calcium deficiency has been beneficial. But, for example, in the UK, the trials of calcium have failed. In most developed countries, calcium trials have failed. So I think that if you're serving a population where calcium deficiency is commonplace, then calcium supplementation for sure would be beneficial. In fact, we do not know much, but it seems like Ukrainian diet in general is low calcium diet. But it, it, it needs definitely more data to understand. But still, it's uh, usually prescribed. Okay, thank you so much. My question is, you know there, that there are actually two paradigma, actually, the, let's say, American one and the British one. British type of uh, prescribing aspirin is more uh, related on the results of first trimester complex prenatal screening, let's say FMF model. But our American colleagues very often say that it does not worth to um, waste money. And uh, according to ACOG recommendations, they start prescribing aspirin according to risk factors. But we understand that much more women in this case receive aspirin and there are a lot of questions. Is it uh, okay to prescribe aspirin for such an amount of women? Because we know that the prediction according to risk factors only is quite low. So what are your thoughts regarding that? Because it's actually like a uh, World War III regarding aspirin that, that we see now. Yeah, um, so I don't know. Um, I'm not certain that the US uh, currently has a good reputation in public health policy. And I'm not sure that we should be talking about taking lessons about public health policy from the US. But that aside, um, very importantly, um, there are many different arguments you brought up. One is the, the current screening program. Uh, the U.S. believe a screening program, which is a checklist, yes, how old are you, how heavy are you, have you had preeclampsia before? Is that what you do in Kiev as well? No. no. The reason you don't do that is that you might tell, for example, the woman who comes in who's 40 that she's high risk of preeclampsia, Victor. For sure, she might be. But then if she's had two perfectly normal pregnancies, no preeclampsia, the babies were a normal weight, uh, she's a normal weight, she doesn't smoke, she's an ex-Olympic Ukrainian athlete, then she's very unlikely to develop preeclampsia despite her being 40 years old. So the issue is that when we use a checklist, we're using all of these factors in isolation, but we're not combining it. We're not combining them and looking at their interactions. So we are only using these risk factors to stigmatize women. We're not using it in a protective way to say all of those other things are negative, so your risks are low. What happens when you do that is that you have a very high screen positive rate and poor predictive ability. Yes, it's wrong, Victor, that in this day and age, you use more computing power, excuse my phone, you use more computing power to order your pizza or to find how to go from A to B in your car than you do to assess the risk of a woman in a pregnancy, which is the most dangerous health event she's going to have in her young life. And that's wrong. And it is really, really risk assessment must be done using an algorithm. And that algorithm at the very minimum must look at the interactions, the risk factors. It can include blood pressure. It can include PAPE or PLGF. Yes, and if you can measure it, you're trying to Doppler. And if you do that, you'll have good prediction. So that's the first thing. There is no excuse, yes, for you and I to use a checklist to assess risk of preeclampsia because that was started 60 years ago when Ukraine was part of another country 
okay? We can't do that anymore. We have to use an algorithm. So number one, that's one. Number two, can you prescribe it to everyone? If you look at all of the population studies, when a woman walks into your office and, and you say, you don't do anything but just look at her notes and say, you should have aspirin. What is the likelihood that the woman will take it? What percentage of women where you just hand out aspirin like it was chocolate, what proportion of women will take it? It's a question for you, Victor. Yeah. Well, we don't actually we don't know in Ukraine. I mean, maybe you have some data we in do. Great Britain. We do. We do. We do have we have national level data that shows that about 25 percent of women will take it. OK. And do you think it's the woman who is obese uh, and black and old that will take it? Or do you think it's a really highly educated, normal weight woman who's having her third baby that takes it? The answer is obvious, actually, because it's those obvious, slimmer, it? yeah. they take care more about their health, usually. That is fantastic. So what happens when you have this policy of just handing chocolates out to women when they walk into your clinic? Yes, it's the same effectiveness as telling someone to lose weight or to stop smoking. It doesn't work. Take more exercise. Stop smoking, lose weight. The three most useful thing, useless things your doctor tells you to do. You want to add one to that to say, yes, also take aspirin. They won't take it, and the women who take it will be the ones that don't need it. Whereas if you do a special test, you check the blood pressure, you say, here is your risk. This is your risk, your high chance. So we need to do something special for you, not for the other 5,000 women that come to my clinic. The compliance in our study was 99%. And 99% who were at high risk took the medication. Not 25% of women who don't need it. So actually, correct me if I'm wrong, currently we have two problems. The first one is to recognize the proper woman and the second to arrange the uh, adequate normal compliance for that. And here, uh, somehow our um, first trimester of prenatal test, it's some sort of a magic that helps us to um, establish good compliance for those women yeah. who are really understand that. And that's the secret, actually. They're linked. Yeah, they're linked. If you if you if you target the women, if you screen the women and you show them the risk, then that is linked to good compliance. So they're both interrelated, but you must do the first one good. And the second one will work out. OK, if you if you have really bad screening, the, the possibility of compliance is very poor. You will not make an impact. Thank you so much. So we always have two sides, like stop smoking. You can say stop smoking immediately. Yeah, maybe it's more helpful. <laughs> but in this case, we can say stop smoking immediately and please look at your test. Here, the best evidence we have currently shows that if you don't do that, you will have problems of pregnancy. And what is more important, that's a window for your future health. And if you would like to be a mother alive and healthy uh, and bring up your children in a normal way for a long time, that's the way, that's a magic pill that will help, that will help you. Maybe that's the way. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, in, in COVID-19 has taught us lots of things. We told the entire country to, to go into lockdown. Yes. Was the compliance to that message good? in 20 year old boys or was it good in 70 year old women with diabetes and obesity yeah it's it's the people who perceive themselves to be at highest risk that complied with the lockdown measures of staying at home and not going out and not touching people yes the same is true in preeclampsia if you tell all you women take aspirin it's not not good but if you say you are the group that is most at risk please take aspirin then they will do so. And I think the message about prevention of preeclampsia should be done early in pregnancy. And the message about future health should be made just after the birth of the baby, because there's lots of data to show that uh, women adhere to lifestyle change messages very, very well in, in just after the baby's born, because that is such a, a, a you know, such, such an important anniversarial effect in their life. Okay. Thank you so much. And just to finish with the aspirin, because one more 
very short and very very important question if we we if we um because of certain circumstances did not prescribe aspirin before 16 weeks but now we have like 19 to 20 weeks and we really because of risk factors or certain let's say i'm sorry intuition or certain feelings would think that in this woman the preeclampsia would appear what is your attitude towards let's say late prescription of aspirin dear baski thank you so much that you are still here we are very sorry you know we were laughing to each other that in old times the apocalyptic angels were plug and hunger and nowadays it's uh, internet absence <laughs> So sorry, and thank you again that you're here. So we have like eight to ten minutes more, and then we'll uh, say goodbye till tomorrow. Please uh, go for further with the question about late prescription of aspirin, because all the country mm. is waiting for your answer. Okay, um, so there is no doubt that aspirin is most effective uh, when started before 16 weeks. But uh, even though some of your mentors may say it has to be started before 16 weeks, that is our ideal objective. But just like in Kiev, in Tuting, we also have women who come late in pregnancy or assess late in pregnancy. Uh, and although it is not as effective, uh, after 16 weeks, there is no doubt that there is still is some amelioration. So um, if started before 16 weeks, uh, you can reduce... Um, uh, preterm preeclampsia by 60 70 percent but if you start it after 16 weeks maybe it's half as effective so the studies would show that it's less effective so it's never too late so still start it but that should not be the public health policy the public health policy should that all women should be screened early in order to have treatments at 16 weeks do you start with same dosage like 150 or you use less yeah so let's uh, the dosage is really important the the first the first study ever published on the effect of aspirin on preeclampsia used 150 milligrams. Yes, for some reason, subsequent studies have used different dosages. We don't know why. Uh, there is very good evidence on the safety of 150 milligrams. And unlike outside pregnancy, where there is no evidence of aspirin resistance, in pregnancy, about 30% of women are resistant to aspirin. Uh, and your prescription of uh, 70, 75, or 80 milligrams, or even 100 milligrams, will be totally ineffective. Mm -hmm. There is no point screening a high-risk population to then give them a medication, which in a third of cases is not going to work. Does that make sense? Maybe. It seems. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so use the right dose. Yeah? The, dose the, the two largest trials have used 150 milligrams and shown the most effectiveness. Why you would then go and use your own dose of 75 or 80 makes no sense at all. UK policy now is 150 milligrams. Thank you so much. Two very short questions from our colleagues. So, a pregnant woman with tachycardia in the second trimester of pregnancy with no changes uh, on cardiac ultrasound and ECG, should she uh, be, um, let's say, observed by cardiologists? Absorbed? Absorbed, meaning does she need more, let's say, let's say deeper attention of cardiologists? In case uh, she has no ultrasound findings. Yeah, the, the, the devil's in the, in the detail of what cardiac assessments have been done, etc., and, and the degree of tachycardia. We, we've just published uh, two or three papers recently to show that Maternal heart rate is one of the key factors in, in assessing risk or maternal adaptation to pregnancy, yes? So an inability to raise your heart rate. So women with low heart rates are more likely to develop preeclampsia if you see that in late pregnancy. So tachycardia actually is a physiological response. So a woman who has a heart rate of 70, 80, 90 is responding and adapting to pregnancy correctly. However, if she has persistent tachycardia above 100, then yes, she should be referred to the cardiologist because that is 
the other end of the spectrum. It's becoming dysfunctional at that stage. The last question from our uh, colleagues um, is regarding, let's say, preconception um, um, care in case of cardiovascular training. Uh, <laughs> does it make sense in prevention of preeclampsia? And what is your attitude towards folic acid as a preventive measure for cardiovascular problems? Okay. The second one is easier. Folic acid, um, but there is no evidence for its benefit. Uh, in terms of pre-pregnancy training, uh, how do I say the name, the surname of those two boxing brothers, the legends? Klitschko Klitsch brothers. Klitschko. 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 Right. Okay. So, you would have to train to be better than the Klitschko brothers outside pregnancy in order to be able to cope with pregnancy. <laughs> Am I making sense? The changes in pregnancy of the heart are so extreme that even your best athletes in Ukraine could not achieve that with a, with a fundamental training program. So I'm not certain, you know, just like saying lose weight and stop smoking, I'm not certain that that is a beneficial process. But what we should do in general is if women have diabetes or heart known heart disease, then we, have, we are better able to control them. The general public health message to be normal weight, to be healthy and not smoke applies whoever you are, whether you're planning a pregnancy or not. Thank you so much. And uh, I think that you have something to say. Not to say, to finish. Thank you very much, Baski. My uh, final question is not about preeclampsia at all, but about this global crisis and uh, our overcoming of all this situation. What do you think, could you predict the, ev the evolution of this situation, of this pandemic? When will the moment come when we will be able to go to each other's country and <coughs> to shake each other's hands? <laughs> The, the answer to that lies in our hands, not in God's hands. Our behavior will dictate when, when, when the chains will be let down. Yeah? So when, when we all behave in a responsible manner, then the sooner that we will all be able to see each other and hug each other. Again. So uh, it depends. How does the rest of the world behave? If they behave well, it will be soon. If they behave badly, it will take a Thank you. But we hope. We still hope. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. We wish you a fruitful and calm day and see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Thanks a lot.